Hi, this is Lamar, and you're listening to Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom. Getting to Third Space is produced by Tenacious Change, a consultancy committed to creating resilient nonprofit organizations. This podcast is available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and Apple Podcasts. Wherever you listen to Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom, be sure to subscribe to hear about new episodes when they become available. Also, be sure to share this podcast with friends, colleagues, and family. The more people join us, the quicker we get to third space as a society. Hey, Lamar, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Tom. How about you? Hey, not too bad. Hey, I had the RSV shot today. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I am so well protected. I mean, it's just it's just absolutely amazing. I could probably travel through the universe and not pick up anything at this point in time. Are you saying that there are no more vaccinations you need to get for a while? Uh, there are no more vaccinations I need to get for a while until, you know, they decide that it's probably time yeah. for another COVID booster. But, uh, you know, I do the annual thing. I get the... Mm -hmm the flu shot and this year I got the COVID shot and this year I also got the RSV. So, mm. um, as a guy that really just doesn't like needles, this is a, <laughs> this is, this is quite something for me. Uh -huh. but, do, do you remember the needles they used when we were kids? Oh yeah. Oh my God. They were huge. They were horrible. They were just, you know, no wonder I start screaming the minute I went into Doc <laughs> DeArmond's office, you know, <laughs> You know, so uh, I remember in school that they were uh, they were did one year where they gave us the vaccines by a uh, high pressure uh, hose and a gun. It is, <gasps> yeah. And uh, that was that was unusual. You think that wouldn't hurt as bad. You're wrong. <laughs> so so what's happening with you? Oh, it's been a busy week. I got to tell you, um, I'm pretty excited. You know, my other gig that I do right now is photography. Yeah. I do quite a bit of photography. Um, I've done it all my career. In fact, I think I've taken a few pictures for you. Um, you have. And, um, but I did sign a lease uh, over the weekend for a small studio in a town nearby. And I've never had a studio outside of my home. So I'm pretty excited about this. So wow. it'll be fun. That will be really great. And yep. so, Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. I, 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 I remember you having a camera decades ago. I won't say how many <laughs> decades, but decades ago. And, uh -huh. uh, and uh, in fact, I think you introduced me, if I'm not mistaken, you may have introduced me to the Pentax K1000. That's an awesome camera. You're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I, still, I still have that. Do camera. you really? I do. Now, okay. it doesn't, it needs a little bit of servicing. And strangely enough, there is a Pentex servicing center yeah. in Wichita, I discovered. At least there was okay. a few years ago when I was thinking about investing in, in getting it uh, cleaned up. And then, of course, digital photography happened. Yeah, right. Well, I still shoot some film. And, um, you know, I have a Roloflex, a, a twin reflex. I have that camera you talked about forever, old Canon FTB. So... I yeah. still shoot some film on occasion. It's still fun. Wow. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, you do well, you do yeah. some great work. I I have to say okay. and if, and if we if we think of it, we'll try to we'll try to drop a few few pictures in here that you've done yeah. um you know, maybe maybe of me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like the one in a bow tie at your wedding. So, you like yeah. that one? All right. I well, like well, if I think of it, <clears throat> we'll include that in the uh, in the video version of this. So All right. Okay. Well, so um, tell us a little bit about what we're going to be talking about so, today. So What's been on your mind? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tom. We're, we're going to continue the conversation that we had last uh, podcast. Um, remember, we talked about uh, barriers of having uh, civil conversation. And I was also thinking uh, it's important at the beginning of all of these that we make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, you know, we talked, our, our title of this podcast is getting to third space with Tom, Lamar and Tom, right? So third space is that, is that safe place that you want to, uh, create for conversations 
that you have with individuals or within groups where difficult things uh, are addressed and you know you you become vulnerable uh, by the process and you learn from each other. I mean, those are the things we're talking about. Uh, and hopefully you and I can model some of that as we go along. Um, but uh, the last uh, podcast, we, we talked a lot about the barriers and where we would like to go today a little bit is dive deeper into some of those, uh, those kinds of relationship or relational um, uh, factors that are important in building good, a good environment and a good process to have a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a positive, uh, uh, positive conversation. In fact, um, you know, we got some feedback last from our last session. I, we always appreciate feedback. So people, please feel free to, to send us emails uh, that's listed on the uh, podcast website. But I had feedback from one individual who said, you know, it's really important for, for that person to make sure that there's trust. Uh, that he can trust the person he's going to have a conversation with. In fact, it's almost like I don't have time to have conversations with people about these kinds of difficult things if there isn't trust involved, because it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Um, and so that's one of the things we want to talk about today. Okay. No, I, I think that sounds really good. And I, like you, I appreciate that feedback that we're getting from folks. And uh, it's it's really great to hear from from folks. It, it, at least we know one or two people are listening out there, right? When we get the feedback, so that's uh, that's that's quite nice. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the things we talked about in preparing for this was uh, introducing something um, that uh, we both know by experience uh, from our professional lives. And and something that that uh, that I worked on developing several years ago, actually, um, when I was working with with young people in a uh, in in public schools, um, I, I worked on a teenage pregnancy prevention program. We did relationship education uh, in the uh, in the public schools, and and one of the activities we did that was really quite a lot of fun and insightful was we asked we asked the young people to tell us about the qualities that they see in some of the healthiest relationships that they've ever observed. And so my colleagues and I, you know, the kids would start shouting these out. Initially, we'd write them on a chalkboard or a, then eventually a whiteboard when things got a little bit more modern, uh, on a whiteboard or, or, uh, or even sometimes just a flip chart. And, and over time, what happened is we got so many different responses from young people. We, one of my associates uh, who handled a lot of research for us was, was uh, decided to catalog all the responses we got in that activity. And we got thousands, we had thousands of young people go through the program. We had lots of responses. And then we did an analysis of it to see, was there any responses that, that really crossed the groups? And what we found was that there were three concepts that really emerged uh, in terms of, of what young people were recognizing com comprised a healthy relationship. And that was that if there was trust in the relationship, if there was respect in the relationship, and if there was honesty, and by that, not just telling the truth, but really integrity in the relationship as well. A few years later, then, I got to take that same, that same bit of work to a... Um, um, one of the Big 12 universities. And I worked with a, a professor there uh, on a project around the hookup culture in, in, uh, among uh, college freshmen. And we did the same activity, and they came up with the same three things in all of those activities, but they added one, which was mutuality or what we might think about as reciprocity, that when two people are in a relationship, they both need to be having to be bringing to that relationship the same things that trust, respect, honesty, but it has to be each of them uh, bring, bring that in. And then also, as we were talking about this, Lamar, we added a fifth thing, which was the sense of ownership that, that, uh, that people coming into a civil conversation with one another, a civil dialogue, they really need to own the process that they are involved with in, in that, in that conversation. So those are the five factors we wanted to offer to folks today.
but I'm going to ask you to, to begin to unpack these for us. And, and uh, we'll, we'll both jump in here and there, but, but you've really got some great ideas around what these really translate into in, 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 in terms of a conversation. You know, um, and I don't remember what year it was, but uh, it was a while back when I actually had a chance to sit in on one of your sessions with, with the, uh, the young people at a school. And that's where I was introduced as well to, to what they were saying and what you were pulling together as, as uh, research data. And at that time, I was, I was doing a lot of therapy work. Um, you know, my background's in clinical psych, and I did quite a bit of work in the community world. Um, and those factors resonated with, with my, particularly those uh, parent-child and those um, relationship types of um, uh, cases that I had. It was, it's, a, it's a very valuable, I think, concept. It seems when you look at it, you go, oh, yeah, of course, but they're really crucial. Um, you know, the, the first one that I already kind of threw out there a little bit earlier was trust. And you think about, um, you know, what what trust is, you know, what trust is like. Um, that I remember, you know, as as a, as a youth going to some of these leadership training kinds of things, and you would have this trust fall, right? Remember that? Oh, oh man, the trust fall. Uh, not not one of my favorite things. I just want to say, I I was I was absolutely sure people were going to let me just drop, or I was afraid I was going to drop people. Yeah, right. Uh, and you're going to disappoint someone. But the 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 point of that whole training was that you could you can only you can only get somewhere in your relationships and, and as a team building exercise or whatever you're doing if you trust those that you're with. And what does that look like? Uh, I think that's an important thing for us to think about. Um, when I go to when I when I have a conversation <clears throat> and um, and I, maybe I don't know this person that well, or maybe I do, and my conversations have not always been that fruitful. Um, it, it, it's up; it's really up to me to start that um, the path on on trust. And sometimes, depending on the type of relationship it is, you may just need to name it and say, "Listen, I think it's really important that that you know." It, it could be about this conversation I'm not going to take outside of this room or that I'm going to, res I'm going to respect. And you'll find that a lot of these things we talk about uh, are kind of like a Venn diagram where they all kind of cross over, but you need to know this is how I'm going to handle it. And I'm going to stay true to that. You can trust that in me. I'm not going to take lightly what you said. I'm going to think about it and process. I, I also want to make sure that that's the kind of relation uh, that's the kind of response you're eliciting for me. So sometimes it can be just as easy or as important as laying it on the table to begin with. I think also for, for me to see it, to, to determine whether someone is trustful or not is how they respond to me. Here's where it's not so much about, um, uh, you know, what, what gets in the way it, it, of relationships it's more about um it is someone consistent in how they 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 are listening or how they're framing what i'm saying when i say framing that means taking what i'm saying or reframing taking what i've said <clears throat> and and processing it and coming back with me and saying okay is I want to make sure I understand, or even though I don't agree, here's what I'm hearing. I mean, that's an important part because I know then that, that you are taking this seriously and I can trust you with this process. Um, or that I think I mentioned last time uh, we talked a little bit about football games and, you know, uh, you know, a team, an athletic team will almost always try to find the weak points in the other team and go after those weak points in an effort to, to win the game. So if we go, if one or both of us are entering this conversation with a desire to win the game, to, to beat the other one, um, we've already, uh, uh, you know, blew the, our ability to have trust. Why would I trust you if you're going to attack me on my weakest areas or in areas that maybe I'm more vulnerable? Um, so 
making sure that um, we're not manipulating people, uh, we're not taking advantage of people by how we approach folks and 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 by how um, uh, how maybe maybe I listen or choose not to listen. Um, you know what it's like, Tom, when uh, you're talking with somebody and and you can tell they're not really processing what you're saying. They heard something maybe, but they're waiting for that break so that they can jump in and and either do a counterpoint or go on to a topic they find more important. They haven't really listened to me. And if I can't trust someone to be listening and in the moment and val uh, uh, validating and valuing what I'm saying, then I think that that uh, demonstrates lack of trust. And and you said something a couple of minutes ago, Lamar, that that you said that they that some of these somewhat kind of meld together in in kind of a Venn drop diagram, like like my fingers coming together actually are supposed to be a Venn diagram, obviously, but no, uh, but they do come together. And and one of those is this is this idea of respect. Uh, I heard you actually refer to that a couple of times. And so, can can you say more about respect and 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 how that fits? Uh, fits into all of this. You, I think we both know, or all of us know, when we're not respected, um, because you get that gut feeling. Of, okay, um, this this just didn't feel good, you know. Um, but re, respect is respect has as a part of of honesty of, of of being validating of me being able to tell you that hey um i may not agree with what you're saying or i'm trying to understand what you're saying but what you're saying is important and i recognize that it's really important to you and it needs to be important to me as i'm trying to process and understand as we work together through this difficult conversation um, and, and we can show that in a lot of different ways. Um, now there's all the nonverbal kinds of things that show that we're engaged, right? Uh, whether it's eye contact, whether it's the reframing that I referred to just a little while ago, or whether it's, um, you know, continuing to stay on, on the topic that that person has been putting out for you to process or to, to consider, uh, without switching to yours. Um, and, and making sure we walk. I was in a conversation a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'd invited this person uh, to have coffee. I like coffee conversations. So we had a coffee conversation. Um, and, and, and they were asking me some really difficult things. Um, we were talking about some difficult things and some stuff that I'd gone through um, with the work that I'd done in the places that I worked before. And then a group of people came in and I noticed that his attention just went to that group of people and he kept looking at them and kept looking because he knew them. And pretty soon I, I felt like I was talking to myself, but I was talking about things that were really important that I had experienced that this person had asked me about. I suddenly felt that the respect level went way down just because of that action. Now, you know, I could have said something snarky at that point, and that wasn't going to be helpful at all, right? Uh, like, hey, I'm over here, uh, or maybe we should wrap this up. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I think it didn't nullify the whole conversation, but it really, uh, it really was a, a negative, had a negative impact. As we were talking in preparation for this, we, we were also talking about this concept of validation as it relates to respect. And it seems like in that situation and in other situations that, that we may be in, uh, the, the, the connection between respect and validation is very, very tight. That if you are feeling disrespected in the moment, or if you are disrespecting the other person that you're speaking to, then it also has the effect of invalidating what it is that they, what they are trying to say or what you are trying to say. Or at least it it may not actually be invalidating it, but it really feels that way. When you are in a conversation, Tom, how do you, 
uh, when is what are the things that happen or the what what goes on in a conversation that you can point to saying that was validating for me? I think it's I think it's really uh, about attention and and about not interrupting that um i am a talker i i'm a i i'm a person who processes by talking and so <clears throat> for me it's really important to hear what i'm saying kind of come out of my mouth and rattle around out, out in outer space there for me to begin to make sense of it and not everybody is like that. And um, uh, some people very close to me, in fact, are not like that. And so their tendency might be to jump into the conversation that I'm having with myself, so to speak, <laughs> before I'm really ready for them to jump into that conversation. So I do have to meander just a little bit. And, and I need a little bit of that space to do that. You know, I, I know that... Um... Uh, you know, I, my wife and I have been married for a lot of years and, uh, we have taken, um, uh, we've had lots of opportunity to figure out how we communicate well and how we don't communicate well. Um, and we, and we don't have it necessarily a hundred percent figured out. That's for sure. But, um, there are things that we've learned about how each of us processes that I think is important too. Um, and, you know, for example, there are times where you may talk, you may be sharing with me about an idea or a thought or something. And my tendency in the past has been to just think about it, ponder it. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with silence, by the way. <laughs> and so you and I could sit here, it'd be really boring for others to watch us, but I could sit here and I could... I could be in silence for a while, just pondering that. But if you don't know what I'm doing, it sounds like I'm, it looks like I'm uh, being disrespectful and it looks like I'm uh, ignoring you or, and certainly not validating the, the, uh, the idea or the thought that you had shared with me. And it took, it, it took us to figure out on that side, what I need to do differently to make sure, you know, I, I'm engaging. Uh, it, you know, and the flip side, it's that as you talked about, you process verbally and that, that sometimes it's you, you want to wait through that whole verbal processing process that you have uh, till you get to that point. And I, and I, I need to learn, I'll wait until you're done. Um, and I do have a tendency sometimes to jump in and interrupt. And it is a problem um, if you don't, if you don't have that working relationship, especially of, um, you know, the person not being valued in what they're saying. Uh, so I get it. It's an important thing. It's something that I have to work on for myself as well. Well, the, here's the good news though, Lamar, is that in this podcast, you can just kind of sit there and ponder and I'll fill up the space. I mean, <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'll just do my open processing, right. You know, right, so it's, right. it, it, it works just fine. <laughs> Or when you edit this thing, you just cut it out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I, I just short, it. I just shorten your pondering down a little bit. <laughs> but you know, all of this talks about our next factor, really, and that's honesty. Um, you know, on how do I know that someone is being honest with me, and what does that look like? In fact, what what we're trying to do is get a sense of what these these factors all look like. Um, and if, if someone is not being honest with me or I, I don't feel that that honesty is right, very being extended, then my trust level goes down. Um, and even maybe my respect. So you see how all these interplay. If, if you, if you think about them um, more as foundational, you know, corner, various points of a foundation, you know, when one point of that foundation changes, it impacts the rest of the points of the foundation. So if honesty is something that I'm questioning, it's going to impact my ability to trust you as a person and as a person involved in the conversation. 
And, and you know, it's, and I don't know if you remember this from the presentation that you saw me do many, many years ago. I, I roughly have an idea when that was, but it was like a very long time ago. Uh, but one of the things that, that we used to, to do with the young people that we worked with when we tied this all together was to say, you know, when you look at trust, respect, and honesty, there's only one of those that you have any control over. And that is, and that's honesty. You can choose how honest you're going to be or whether you're going to be a person of integrity with the other person. You can't make them trust you. You can't make them respect you. All you can do is earn that through your interaction with them. And so that's the, uh, that's the value of, of really, really understanding that you have, the only thing you really have any control over is, is that, that sense of, are, are you being honest? Are you being a person of integrity with them? And something you said too, Lamar, how do we know when the person is being honest with us? And, you know, I think that is one of the hardest things to tell when it's just one-on-one -on -one with people. And particularly if you haven't interacted with that person on a regular basis. I, I, and so I'm, I'm, I'm almost inclined to think that you can't always tell in a conversation if somebody is really being honest with you. You, you almost need to know who they are outside of that conversation. And have they, have they interacted with the world around them in a way that is honest and with integrity? And, and I say that as a person who I would like to tell you that in my life, I have always been absolutely honest. I have always been a person of integrity. The problem is, Lamar, you know me too well. You know some ways that I have so totally blown it that we will never talk about in this podcast, but I have, I have absolutely messed up in terms of, of being a really a person of integrity and, and honesty. But you know what? We, 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 uh, it's, it's still important for us to, to extend some grace and understand that maybe this person is not absolutely a person of integrity, but there is an essence, a core of who they are that, that, that on balance, we feel like we can trust what they're saying more than we can distrust what they're saying. Is that, is that making any sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think Tom, part, part of what you just, you know, shared is, it, it is part of how, how we develop. Um, you know, I, I've had, I've had places that I worked before in the most places you wouldn't think that this, this would be a problem where honesty was really, it was hard to find and it was hard to be honest because oftentimes if you were honest, you got yourself in, into a mess or you get yourself into a, a corner that, um, you know, was very uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it's, it's too bad to say that, but it was, um, I've also, I, and I would say in my last, uh, 11 years of work found, uh, an opportunity to work at a work at places where I could be as totally honest about my about things that I've said, things that I've done, and things that um, decisions that were made, regardless of whether people like them all the time or not. At least I could I could say this is what I did, um, and I didn't feel bad about it. So I think some of it has to do with the environment. I think some of it has to do with us maturing. And feeling confident that you know what we we're okay to make mistakes, you know, um, gosh, the mistakes that I've made over my career and things that I wish I could do differently. Um, those, if I don't admit to those, to be honest, to be honest with you, um, if I don't admit to those, uh, I haven't learned anything. And um, and so back to back to what honesty is about in, in these conversations. That's an important piece. There's another side to that part of honesty, and that is that you're not using your your conversation or your your interaction as a way to manipulate. Um, and it's really possible, easy to do. Um, for example, taking half half truths or using only part of data to to uh influence your uh your conversation um and you know you know both of us come from 
um, you know, research background in, in our in our lives. And to you know how you can use research multiple different ways. But to be able, when you see research being used honestly, saying, here's what we know, here's what we weren't able to determine, rather than saying, well, we found the one thing we were looking for, so therefore it must be true. <laughs> You know, it's all true because we found the one thing. And and I so much appreciate it. it's a breath of fresh air when you when you listen to people and you have a conversation with people saying, here's what I, I think I know and why I think I know it. But I'm open to to hearing more. Well, you know, and the the, the uh, something you said just made me think of this, um, that you can also use honesty as an opportunity to bludgeon somebody. And, uh, and so I, I'm thinking back to this uh, comedy routine that I saw Craig Ferguson, who's a British comic do a few years ago. And, and it was one of the funniest segments in the comedy routine. I think I've ever seen. He's, you know, he poses this situation of, let's say somebody walks up to you and uh, they're they're wearing this outfit that is just so absolutely atrocious, and and they say to you, "How do you like my new outfit? What does it do for me?" Right? And and he he talks about these these this process that he goes through immediately in those kinds of situations, and he he asked him, himself these three questions: Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said now? And does this need to be said by me now? And and sometimes in those moments of uh, in conversation with somebody that can be kind of challenging, we may be really tempted to stray off into things that we don't need to say in that moment, and and that don't really need to be discussed. And so, uh, you know, as funny as his routine is, I find myself going back to those three questions all the time. When I'm in those kinds of conversations, am I the person to say this? Does it need to be said now? And uh, does it really even need to be said? Maybe not. You know, uh, on, on kind of a, a different level, I find I find people are are wanting to compliment if they're in those situations as much as they can, because it's easy. Uh, and, you know, like when I do a photography show and people come to the show, you know, I'm I'm looking obviously to feed my ego, to feed my self worth, and say, "Yep, yeah, you're doing pretty dang good." Uh, you know, someone likes what I've done, but I also need to be open and appreciative of those who are saying, "You know, here's an idea that you might want to consider. Here's something you might want to do differently, or here's how you might want to present this particular photo differently." I don't learn unless one, I'm open to being uh, to hearing that kind of feedback. And um, and hearing an honest criticism, people who are willing to do that at your invitation will often do it well. They're not going to try to hurt you. Uh, but to me, there's and that's just kind of a a, a non weighty kind of a thing. But in your in a conversation with someone, it's I think it's important uh, to to be able to to be honest without taking an opportunity to put him down or to hurt him. Um, I've got, I, I have a conversation coming up tomorrow that I set up. It's, it's going to be a difficult conversation and I'm preparing for it because I, I really respect this person and I want us to be able to continue to have good ongoing relationships, but we need to work through some things. And so I want to be honest, but I also want to be respectful. All these things we're talking about are really on my mind right now about how to put them in play as I'm going into that meeting in the morning. Well, I think we've got a couple more to cover that we said we would cover. One is reciprocity. That's that's an interesting word, isn't it? To say that three times really fast. Reciprocity. Uh, or mutuality. Same. Uh, the idea is the same thing that it actually, you know, both people have to be invested in it. Do you want to say more about that? Well, you know, um, I think about this story you told a couple of podcasts about uh, go about a, a group that was working on a project, and a politician comes in and says, "Hey, this is this is the deal. It's got to be done this way," and then walks out and, and just realizes, maybe didn't realize, kind of the nest that he had kind of stirred up. <clears throat> when I'm this conversation that I'm having tomorrow, 
we're both invested in it. And I know we're both invested. He was, he said, I'm really happy uh, that we're getting together to talk through this. I think that to me tells me that we were one step closer to having a successful conversation tomorrow. Um, but if, if I wanted to have the conversation uh, with an individual or in a group even, and here's where sometimes I have to really watch myself, I may want to have a conversation and nobody else in that group wants to have that conversation. <laughs> um, I need to be sensitive to that and not not push that any further. And I think I've done that. And that's part of my conversation tomorrow with this individual is I, I want to work through um, the most important parts uh, and, and, and make sure that I don't go further than where he's willing to go as well, because I may have an agenda or issues that are important to me that are not at all important to this person. And so I think defining what's important is going to be part of this mutual reciprocity and uh, uh, piece to to working together in good communication. And and actually, it, it, as I've been listening to you talk about that, I'm thinking that that this concept of ownership is really pretty close to those two things. Um, maybe it's differentiated only slightly uh, by the fact that that when both of you are in that conversation or or when the, any two people are in that kind of dialogue or, or or civil conversation that they that both really have to feel like they are owning that process and and not only the process but when they walk out of the room that they're owning what happens after that process uh, I, you're absolutely right and ownership of uh, also, ownership of the things we didn't do well. <clears throat> I think that's another piece. I, I would, uh, I would say where I have learned a lot, and it wasn't always uh, something that I did well at all, but something I really try to work with is when I have screwed up, when I have, maybe I haven't shown respect, or I maybe damaged some trust, or maybe, maybe a little bit of hyperbole, or or not necessarily being as um, clear on the data as I needed to be. I need, if I can come back and own that, I, one, I think it, it reestablishes a relationship that, that may have been damaged, but two, I feel much better. I mean, I feel like I, it, it empowers me again saying, you know, I screwed up here or I said something that wasn't quite true. Um, let's back up and let's, let's uh, regroup. But owning that part of our, involvement and com part of the conversation is important. Well, you know, the, the old clock on the wall, or actually the clock on the computer, is is uh, telling us that we uh, probably need to be winding down. But Lamar, can you do a quick recap what where we've been? Yeah. So what we did today was we took our conversation about barriers and hurdles from last podcast to a different level of, of relationships with a person that we're having conversation with. Realizing that sometimes that those relationships may be just brand new, fresh, and at that moment, or they may be lifelong kinds of relationships. It doesn't really matter, but we have these five, these five factors that we, you and I believe are important. You know, trust, respect, honesty, reciprocity, and ownership. Uh, they all work together and they can, they can be part of any relationship. Parent, child, you know, spouse, significant other, you know, friend, um, a group that you're working with, these uh, these five factors are valuable foundational factors you can use in almost any kind of a setting. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Well, yep. now we get to one of our favorite <laughs> times, which is things that make us smile stories, right? So uh, we've got a couple of interesting ones today that uh, will either gain us listeners or maybe <laughs> lose us listeners. I, I don't know. Uh, do you want to go first? You want me to go first? No, I'll go. I'll go first. We'll end up on yours. Um, so I, I ran across this. Um, I honestly, don't know where we always get all this stuff. I think this, this uh, news bit comes from the Huffington Post where I saw it, but I'm sure it's, it's an AP story. Um, but this, this woman um, from Iowa, our home uh, state, our, our home, home state, state, Iowa, the Hawkeye state, 
um, was was stopped by federal custom agents as she entered back into the country um, because she declared uh, a box of things she brought back from Africa that she was going to make jewelry out of. And one of those things was giraffe feces. <laughs> now, growing, growing up on a farm, I've seen a lot of that of feces, but I've not seen giraffe feces. So I'm looking at a picture of it and I'm just trying, trying to imagine <laughs> what that might look like around someone's neck, you know, <laughs> a necklace. I don't know. But um, she soon found out that there's a lot of uh, problems with bringing um you know, dung in from another uh, country, especially a lot of health, health issues, obviously. we These are things this person should have known. I can't imagine what it was like for federal custom agents to have to sit down with her and say, listen, giraffe feces is just not one of the things we're going to let you bring in to the state of Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, in the in the vein of things that might not be the healthiest for you, <laughs> the, uh, the story, uh, the, the thing that makes me smile this week is this um, story that comes from Wales and a children's charity that where they collect toys for children. Right. Yeah. Right. And so the only thing I can do is just actually read to you the statement that was issued by the, by the charity and uh, if I if I had any kind of way of of mimicking a, um, a a UK accent, I would actually try, but I don't. And so I'm just going to read it in my best Midwestern lang uh, voice and language here. So, but but listen to what this says. Could those of you who kindly donate please be mindful that we are a children's charity. And as such, we have a range of ages on our wonderful volunteer team, the statement reads. Now, here's where it gets good. We therefore ask that you refrain from donating your used and unused marital aids. We would like to remind you, and I love this, we would like to remind you that the branch has CCTV so that all these things can be traced back <laughs> to their owners. Thank you. So, um, you know, let's just lay it out there. You know, people are donating used and unused sex toys to this uh, children's charity in Wales. And it was just, you know, between that and the giraffe doo-doo, it, it, it just... <laughs> <laughs> you talk about two potential health risks. <laughs> I just don't think we need to even explain much more. No, I don't think so. <laughs> it's just it's just kind of like all out there this week in terms yep. of the things that make us smile. So, um, well, I guess we've come to that time. We're going to wind this down. Um, we are um, we're anticipating that we are going to have a guest yes. on our next podcast. We won't say much more about it just in case schedules change because this this person lives in a pretty fast-paced world and um, things can change and uh, we're scheduled right now but things could happen so um, but we're looking forward to um, uh, podcast episode five which will feature feature a guest and um, we'll um, we'll be doing that later this week and posting it soon absolutely and I think it's all it's good to say that you know we've asked lots of questions of ourselves on these podcasts <clears throat> and we've decided we're going to ask someone else some of the questions we're asking ourselves. So I'm curious to see where this goes. Yeah, I am too. I am too. All right. Okay. Lamar, I guess that's it for today. See you in a couple of days. All right. Take care, man. All right. Bye. Bye. Tom here. Thank you for listening to getting to third space with Lamar and Tom. Remember to click on subscribe to be sure you get notices about new episodes. Getting to Third Space with Lamar and Tom is a production of Tenacious Change. Opinions and ideas expressed in this podcast are solely those of Lamar Roth and Tom Klaus. And we'd like to hear your opinions and ideas too. You can leave us a voice message on Spotify 
or you can email us at the addresses found in the show notes. Also in the show notes, you can find links to some of the things we talked about today so you can check them out for yourself. Until next time, keep moving toward third space.